Mine might have been like a millisecond late because I. I think I was dead on. Damn. Okay. Sweet. Okay, Brie, you're on. Occult Confessions is brought to you commercial free through the generous support of our patrons. Visit occultconfessions.com and click on donate to help keep the history of the occult on the digital airwaves. Today we're going to talk about the temple of psychic youth. No. For those of you hearing about them for the first time, there are no spelling errors in our title. Eccentric spelling is kind of a hallmark of the temple, and the temple, I should say. And at least one of the words in their name has a double meaning. These chaos magicians and experimental musicians played with sound as a tool for subconscious occult exploration, opposed the control mechanisms of organized religion and mainstream culture, sent bodily fluids through the postal service, were caught up in the satanic panic and falsely accused of ritual abuse and developed a non-binary, gender-fluid lifestyle called pandrogyny. Today, we elicit the occult confessions of the temple of psychic youth. It's a special episode. Um, It's a... (laughs) special episode for several reasons. We are nearing the end of our year. This isn't exactly the end of our year, uh, but the crew today is a a crew we have not had together in in some time. My name is Rob C. Thompson. I am your supreme hierophant of our secret order of alchemical actors. I am joined today by not one, but two literal sisters. That's right. We have, as is customary, Olivia Literal, Grand Master of the Order, Hello. And our metallurgic prophet, Brianna Literal. Literal sisters, back at it again. Oh, man, I'm so (laughs) glad you said that. I know, I have. I always feel like, I don't know, it makes me feel like we're like the weird sisters or like the fox sisters. I don't know. I know, it makes me feel really powerful. Like we are, (laughs) yeah, like something, I don't know. You're the Fox sisters, and I'm your old, I'm older sister Leah pimping you out (laughs) for cash. Actually, you know. (laughs) That's not it, it's, kind of. That's not far. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> all right, so this I think you two are perfect. You are the most occulty of all of the alchemical actors. Wow. Uh, so to talk about the temple, right? I think that's true. That's fair, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I would say I, that's pretty fair. I agree. Yeah. I mean, that sounds narcissistic when it really I does say, when it, you say it, but what? when you say it, yeah. <laughs> we'll just I'm willing it. to. I'm willing to ascribe <laughs> that label. Because this is, we're going to go kind of deep on the occulty stuff today. The Temple, this is an episode I think a lot of folks have been looking forward to, um, and we've made them wait all year. And uh, yeah, these these folks, The Temple, boy, they do some crazy stuff. Uh, so let's, um, let's pledge it out and uh, get down to it. We, the members of the Secret Order of Alchemical Actors, do solemnly commit ourselves to a full and honest telling of the history of the occult as far as we know it. Sounded pretty good. Uh, Okay, so we're going to skip all the business today. We're going to get right into it. Uh, so here's what I just want to lay out how I'm going to do the episode because again, lots of folks are excited about this topic. Um, so, so I don't want anyone to be disappointed. This is what we're going to cover. We're going to start by covering the founder, Genesis Briar Peoridge of the Temple of Psychic Youth. Sometimes I'm going to call them psychic, sometimes psychic. I have a hard time pronouncing psychic, but that's how it's spelled is psychic. And I think psychic is probably all right. Yeah, it kind of hurts me when you say it the other yeah. way. Yeah. It just doesn't <laughs> feel right. I don't know. So we're going to start with uh, Genesis Briar Peorage. Uh, then we're going to cover the temple itself and the history specifically of the temple. And we're going to close with a topic that's very near and dear to me, which is their occult and artistic experimentation with sound and sampling. So those are the major areas we're going to go through this day. You guys ready? Yeah. Hell Yeah. All right, let's start with Genesis Briar P. Orich. The Temple of Psychic Youth was the brainchild of one of the inventors of industrial music. You guys know what industrial music is? Uh, barely. Barely. Yeah, I vaguely, I vaguely <laughs> yeah, understand Me neither, it. really. It's sort of like house music. Yeah. yeah. So P. Orich was born Neil Andrew Megson, which is not nearly as cool. That is a rough, Wait, what is it? rough name. 
Genesis' original name was Neil Andrew Megson. Megson. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's really... I don't think you yeah. can... You can't start a temple with that. <laughs> can't you can't carry it. You can start a cult with that. No, I don't think you could. <laughs> uh, but on the 22nd of February, 1950... Born in Manchester, England, uh, a place where we find quite a few of our occultists. My personal favorite occultist, Emma Harding Britton, her library is housed in Manchester. Oh, field trip. Yeah, right. I'd actually like to move there for a, a year or six months and do some research there. We would fall apart. Anyhow, I, I think you would be all right. We would just have to do this at like weird hours. <laughs> I guess we're kind of already halfway there. Yeah, we're doing fine. Yeah. From 1975 until 1981, P. Orridge, uh, along with bandmates Peter Christofferson and Cosi Fanny Tutti, as well as Chris Carter, developed... <laughs> There's no... <laughs> Speaking of names, what? there are no more polary, polarly different names than Cosi Fanny Tutti and Chris Carter. <laughs> there, yeah. <laughs> two very different, different names. Different vibes there. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, this is their band. Uh, they developed what would be called a new genre of music under the band name Throbbing Gristle. And they developed oh the industrial that music a... sound. <laughs> what is it with these names in this episode? Throbbing Gristle? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a badass, like, punky band name, don't you it think? It sounds like some bizarre innuendo. I don't... <laughs> oh, I'm sure it's that too. Yeah, don't get me wrong. Throbbing Gristle. Their shows featured jarring imagery, including fascist symbols and pornography. Hmm. And their music, I'm on board with one of those. Yeah, yeah same. for sure. <laughs> Especially these days. But this was the late 70s, early 80s. I guess fascist symbols are always not cool. Right now, they're especially not cool. They're, they're a little too in American spaces anyway. And I think our international listeners know what I'm talking about as well. Uh, so... Because unfortunately, we're in the international press this country for bad reasons. Yeah. Anyway, <clears throat> that is to say, uh, they made uh, found sound. They used found sound, uh, which is non-musical sounds, as well as samples of other kinds of music in their music. You got me? Mm-hmm. So clip out, you know, pieces of other tra- other songs. And then they would also use, you know, just like street traffic and, and that sort of stuff. And this is how they would piece together this industrial music sound. I'm guessing more like manufacturing sounds and industrial music. I don't really know. I didn't get too far into industrial music when I was researching this. Uh, Okay, so Peorage founded their second major band. uh, And let me clarify here. Peorage is, uh, or I guess I I would define Peorage as non-binary. So I'm choosing to use they and them for Peorage. And we'll get to that in a little bit. But uh, for anyone who's listening and they're like, what? Peorage founded their uh, second major band, Psychic TV, with former Gristle bandmate Peter Christofferson and also this guy Alex Ferguson. The project was at least in part a kind of mouthpiece for Peorage's The Temple of Psychic Youth, which Peorage led from 1981 to 1991, so a decade of The Temple. As Psychic TV's name implied, they worked in both music and experimental video. T-O-P-Y, why? Because we like you, was also at least... Im- what? Wait, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. T-O-P-Y is the acronym for, of course, the temple. <laughs> okay. Oh. But th- they don't say why because we like you every time they say their name. That would be silly. Could we- hold on. I have- <laughs> so this is like the 80s? Is that... Yes, this is literally the 80s. What? 81 to 91, this is the 80s. Legitimate question. Was like non-binary like... Is that even a like a term that existed in the eighties? Was it? Well, technically, or... yeah. No, it no, no. It, it, I I think that not in the way that it is now. Peorage is very innovative. Yeah. He's cutting it. They are cutting edge. Sorry, so if I keep make if I make that mistake, um, but they are cutting edge. So at the I believe in the eighties, uh, and listeners can correct me if I'm wrong here because I'm sort of just off the cuff here. I'm very I curious don't believe. About this. I don't believe that Peorage would have identified non-binary at this time period. Right. Okay. But ultimately, the, the, we'll get to how they become or sort of innovate in the non-binary area. Well, that's super neat, though, that they kind of... Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, Peorage is groundbreaking, trailblazing left and right. Industrial music, chaos magic, and gender. The trifecta. Did you say the trinity? I said the trifecta, the tr- but yeah, it's oh, close I enough. So the, the trifecta. Holy Trinity. Also. The Holy, the holy trinity. trifecta. 
<laughs> it's chaos magic gender and, and what was the first music. one? Oh, industrial music Hell yes yeah. of course that is what we all strive to yep. unite with <laughs> temple uh at least in part a collaboration with musician and male artist okay so by male i mean m-a-i-l artist of the male so the temple was both the work of psychic tv and p orage and this other person this artist this male artist, postal service artist. This guy's name was Monty Kazaza. Well, that's a name. Or is, I guess. Yeah. Okay. So you're going to love this character. That's a name. <laughs> He's a regular con- collaborator with Psychic TV throughout the 80s and one of the most eccentric figures in the industrial music scene. The American-born Kazaza was thrown out of the California College of Arts and Crafts when he disabled the main stairway of the college's Oakland building with his first sculpture assignment, a cement cascade. Please Think tell about me that for a second. he just poured <laughs> cement down the stairs and made a massive just ramp instead of yes. stairs. But like, well, I mean, I, yeah, I assume it would go down the steps like a slinky, but yeah. Oh my god! In my head, <laughs> it there. looks incredible. Yes. Like... <laughs> he carried a dead cat, or rather, a series of dead cats, to friends' houses, which he would set on fire <gasps> after dousing the corpses with formaldehyde. Okay, I'm really? not into that. I'm not. Wait, I'm upset wait, no, about no, 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 no. Did he kill the cats, or were they already dead? History does not tell me, Bree. <gasps> if they were already the dead, at their end. If they were already dead. I'm kind I'm of guess into it, yeah. but if I he killed them, dead, I'm not. I guess because but... if he if he didn't kill them, that's pretty. It's pretty metal. As an artist, I think it's more likely that he's finding them, good, or getting them from the biology lab or something. Yeah. Okay, that's what I'm gonna believe. Yeah, me too. He was inspired by the future. Well, he's got formaldehyde too, so I bet he's taken those uh, mm. dissected corpses. Okay. Oh, okay. That's again, I guess. If anyone knows otherwise, I will be so impressed. <laughs> if you, don't if you tell know how Monty Unless Kazaza he's killing was. them, don't tell us yet. Don't tell Got us. those cats. Please. He was inspired by the Futurist movement, which was a modernist avant-garde movement that deliberately provoked its audiences. It, it began with the Italians before the, uh, the World Wars to create work that walked the line between total chaos and artistic exhibition. Likely with at least some help from Kazaza, Purage managed a couple of attention-grabbing moves in the name of Psychic TV. On their first album, he played the Klangling, which is a Tibetan instrument made of a human thigh bone. That's so cool. Whoa. That's a lot to... <laughs> Bree is the perfect person, yeah. That... <laughs> Bree's got the abnormal reaction. Olivia has the normal reaction. Uh... <laughs> I just need to think about it. I'm like... I think okay. that is the coolest thing. He invited Church of Satan founder Anton LaVey to speak the Lord's Prayer backward on his song, Joy. Oh, my God. Wow. That's sort of right in the face of the Paul is dead crowd and all the conspiracy Wait. theorists of uh, <sighs> rock. That kind of sounds a little bit familiar, but not really. That's crazy. <laughs> Their 1985 single, God Star, charted in the UK, the closest purage would come to anything like mainstream acceptance. In 1986 and 87, Psychic TV released 17, 17 live albums on a monthly basis. So every month they would release another one. Well, okay. This earned them the Guinness record for most records released in a single year. (laughs) That's crazy. The record for records. Then, between 88 and 91, Psychic TV produced compilation albums featuring fake artists working under pseudonyms to give the impression that there was a thriving, quote, acid house scene in the UK led by Psychic TV. That's pretty cool. As far as I can figure it, acid is house music featuring squelching sounds. I love that. I'm not even lying. That is... (laughs) So... Oh, my God. Acid house is not... Like psychedelic, you think like LSD, it's not right? For I think people it, on acid. No, no. I believe that the term acid house refers to the sounds acid actually makes, <laughs> like the chemical, you know, acid, acidic chemical, acidic chemicals. This is like early ASMR, but like not. <laughs> I enjoy wild. this so much. In 1992, Topy was caught up in the why because we like you was caught up in the satanic panic. I can't help myself. I really don't um, like it when you do that. It throws me off. I am like, what is he talking about? Anyway. 
Okay, so let's do Temple of Psychic Youth and Satanic Panic. On an episode of Channel 4's Beyond Belief in the UK, uh, so the Channel 4 is a, for those of you who are not UK listeners, Channel 4 is a big freaking channel in the UK. It's like BBC or something. Yeah, it's one of their okay. big stations. Like we have NBC, ABC, CBS, they have Channel 4, and Channel 4 is one of those big stations. So they produced Beyond Belief, which made the unusual claim that footage from an experimental film made by the temple, funded in part by Channel 4, for let me say this again, funded in part by this channel for a program on experimental British movies was evidence of real satanic ritual abuse. I just want to take a moment here. Let me walk you through this one more time. Please do. Yeah. Channel 4. Mm-hmm. Cha- so this, this TV station, Channel 4, airs a special accusing the temple of satanic ritual abuse be based on footage of an experimental movie that Channel 4 paid them to make hmm. earlier in the in the decade, or I guess the decade before. The video was called First Transmission and featured images of naked women, sex acts, and ritual scarification, as well as band member John Balance, bound and hooded, being peed on. Hmm. Oh, shit, that's kinky. Yeah, okay. pretty kinky stuff. I, spe- I think the ritual scarification might be the kinkiest part of that. Oh, I yeah. thought the being peed on was oh, some new I've, shit. I thought the ritual yeah. scarification was... Oh, not everyone is getting peed on. Being peed on happens all the time. Scarification Left happens and right. constantly. Are you joking? I feel like I'd rather I one have of the opposite perspective. over the other, though. I think people are peed on all the time and not ritually yeah, scarified. Yeah, I agree with that. Well, I'd... ritually scarified, okay, but scarification in general is a huge thing in like my generation, I feel like. I still feel like people might get peed on more. <laughs> this is an interesting debate. Please let us know what you think. Um, your thoughts? On any of we'll our take a poll. Scarification or being urinated on. Which one happens We'll have Shannon more? run a poll. <laughs> Shannon's going to be like... Oh, God, no. Don't make Shannon run that poll. <laughs> no, we Wouldn't will. Wouldn't that be hilarious on Insta? Which is kinkier? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the voices of the director, Derek Jarman, and also the... Uh, sort of popular underground tattoo artist Mr. Sebastian were also featured on this video. Despite the fact that the video had been created as a staged work of fiction, the police raided the homes of TOPY members, seized a variety of artistic works, and people came out of the woodwork to accuse the temple members of offering drugs to children. Peorage and their family were out of the country in Thailand, this is not even, uh, I'm not making this up. This is true. This is what they were doing. Helping with famine relief work. Oh, wow. When this all went down. Oh so Peorch is literally like out being a humanitarian as cops are descending on their home. And they chose not to return to the UK, but rather emigrate to the United States for fear that their children would be taken away from them. The 90s also saw the creation of Peorage's life-encompassing Pandrogeny project. So this is what you've been curious about. I already know I'm going to be on board. It already sounds perfect. I don't know. I don't know if you're going to want to do it. This is oh. hardcore, but it okay. is it is cool. With Lady J, J-A-Y-E, uh, Jacqueline Breyer, Peorage and, and J. Breyer worked to create the Pandrogyne by undergoing procedures intended to make their bodies look more like each other's. Okay, Attempting to meld in the middle as a kind of dual, single being. What? They're trying to do DBZ fusion? Like, I don't understand. I'm what do confused. you mean? They're not, I mean, they're not literally trying to become um, conjoined, but they want to become essentially twins. They want to be identical. Oh, oh, so that but, if you were to line them up half and half, they would be one. Yeah, they're not. It's mm. not like Pure oh, is trying to two become halves of female. The same yeah. Is what we're saying? Yep. I think not so. but, but, entirely but they're one. Both, yeah, but they're both becoming gender n- n- in the middle. Like Pure is becoming more feminine and Lady J is becoming more masculine, right? So they're meeting okay. in the middle. Okay. Pandrogyne, pandrogynous. Hmm. Together, they spent over $200,000 on various surgeries, Dear including Lord. breast, chin, and cheek implants, hormone therapy, and tattoos. That actually sounds cheap to me, given the way healthcare expenses How are going these it? days. 200000 
Oh, yeah. yeah I don't even – God, I feel like it's not a lot of insurance even now covers like transitional kind of surgeries. Well, and like a biopsy can be like 10 grand. So I I don't know. Mm. In the United States, anyway. They hope to dissolve their previous beings into this new third being. Uh, I'm going to actually take a bit from Peorge's psychic Bible to explain the thought process behind this gender bending life art initiative. The binary systems embedded in society, culture, and biology are the root cause of conflict and aggression, which in turn justify and maintain oppressive control systems and divisive hierarchies. Dualistic societies have become so fundamentally inert, uncontrollably consuming and self-perpetuating that they threaten the continued existence of our species and the pragmatic beauty of infinite diversity of expression. In this context, the journey represented by their pandrogyny and the experimental creation of a third form of gender-neutral living being is concerned with nothing less than strategies dedicated to the survival of the species. Peorage died in New York City on the 14th of March 2020 of leukemia, just one day after most of the U.S. would begin to shut down as a result of COVID, and 13 years after their pandrogynous partner, Lady J. Briar Peorage, died of complications from stomach cancer. So it's really timely that we're getting to Peorage right now because, uh, yeah, Peorage literally just died last year. Damn, that's crazy. Well, we don't. Yeah. I feel like we don't talk a lot of pe- We don't talk about a lot of people that have like just died. just passed. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and one day after, one day after COVID became national, international news. He did, or mm-hmm. Like for me, he, for us, yeah. yeah. No, they didn't. Nobody needed to see that. Pure H checked out. Okay, so let's talk about the temple. For chapter two, the temple. Peorage wanted to use popular culture as what they called the alchemical jar, a kind of open-ended occult experiment. They wanted to see fans as more than an income or ego boost for musicians. Rather, fans could be a means to create a, quote, cultural and lifestyle-directing network, specifically in this case for demystified magical techniques. This effort was fairly successful. At its height, TOPY had over 10,000 registered members with stations in Australia, North America, Scandinavia, and Europe. Some people may think that number is kind of small, but we're talking about official membership. So there could have been a lot of fans who were, you know, following the lifestyle but weren't registered members. The teachings of TOPY focused on personal liberation, which comes at least in part by embracing the fractured nature of self and consciousness. Explore daily your deepest desires, fantasies, and motives, gradually focusing on what you would like to happen in a perfect world, a perfect situation. Taking away all restrictions and practical considerations, what you would really want. We each have many personalities operating inside of us, many of which contradict each other. Judging these varying personalities to be dangerous, especially the ones closest to our subconscious drives, we weed them out and sanitize ourselves down to a single self. Our social selves, the face we put on for the public, becomes our whole self, rendering us one of the flat people. We don't want to be a flat people. The flat people? Fuck that. Yeah. So basically, I mean, I I talk about this in class about um, performance of self, that we Mm -hmm. have a sort of idealized version of ourselves that we bring to the world. That's our public self. Yeah. Basically, what the temple is saying is you should not strive to get rid of all your other selves that aren't that public face. If you just become that public face all the time, that sort of like sanitized, idealized version of yourself, then you're neglecting all the other selves that also need to be part of you. You don't want to become flat. Damn right you don't want to become flat. I agree. The subconscious, called intuition and instinct in this context, rises to the surface, as is common in magical practices going all the way back to the first spiritualist mediums and mesmerists. The emphasis is on discovering one's true desires without recourse to guilt or shame. By practicing at imagining and realizing these desires, the magician is better able to uncover and know them. There's an existentialist ethos that the individual should take their cues from intuition and instinct, but also take full responsibility for everything they do and everything they are. A new era of the magical interpretation of the world and existing in its coming in interpretation in terms of will and imagination fueled by contact with intuition and instinct. 
the voluntary relinquishing of responsibility for our lives and actions is one of the greatest enemies of our time. Sex is central to this program as sex is considered the area of greatest repression but also greatest potential liberation. Another common theme, this time not going quite so far back as the spiritualist, but catching on closer to Aleister Crowley. I'll put a caveat in there that there were spiritualists like Victoria Woodhull, for example, who were very interested in free love, uh, but you know it wasn't central to spiritualism. So we're really seeing, and the neat thing about chaos magic is we can see these trends tracing through hundreds of years of history now. I mean, we can go all the way back to the 18th century with the mesmerists and Franz Anton Mesmer and see the subconscious as this dominant theme of modern occultism all the way up now to Purge in 1991, 1992 and, and the, the temple. And we can see sex as this other major theme that is under the surface, I think, with the mediums is present, but under the surface. Because, you know, they're enfranchising women and this sort of thing. Sexual liberation is sort of lingering in um, 19th century mediumship. But then with Crowley, it goes wild, right? And it just carries through as this thread from person to person to person, from tradition to tradition. The repression of sexual instincts functions to make people submissive and inclined to irrational behavior and thus paralyzes their rebellious potential. On a deeply personal level, where we enter the domain of such energies, which might be called magical, the effect of such conditioning is no less significant. Psychic energy and sexual energy are different names for the same force. By ridding ourselves of restrictions and the forms of control which we have imposed on us, we can come into our own on more planes than one. The initiation rite for the Temple of Psychic Youth is a fantastic and creative blend of performance art, male art, and occultism. It's called the Sigil of Three Liquids. Ooh. The magician is naked with a candle and a scrap of paper on which he or she has written his or her deepest sexual fantasy. The paper is made special with spit, blood, and av. Okay, so what is I, av? I, I mentioned at the very top of the episode that there's a kind of double entendre in the Temple of Psychic Youth's name. They don't say av of. It's the Temple of OV Psychic Youth. OV is the liquid obtained by masturbation, uh. m- meaning either the female's lubrication or the male's semen. I mean, I guess if we're being technical here, you can also obtain it <laughs> with a partner <laughs> or multiple partners Where if you so choose. Where is the OV coming from, though? Yeah, that's... It's your OV. I mean, it feels a little like... I think of ovulation. ovulation. Yeah, that's yeah. what I think. I mean, maybe that's the play. It's sort of the play on sexual fluid, of ovulation, ovum, huh. right? Okay. So okay. the man, the male's testicles, the female's uh, ovum. All right. <laughs> All right. The aspiring magician attaches a lock of hair from his or her head and also, of course, some pubic hair. Mm-hmm. After uh, pubic hair, by the way, you have to have some, so... Who doesn't? Quit all that. Quit all that. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> do we want to do this right now? Have the pubic hair talk? Don't yeah, be self-conscious we... about your pubic hair. Yeah, we're gonna go. We're gonna talk sex magic this year, and I think that Olivia and I could probably, and Brie also, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll talk about pubic uh, we... hair all day. Oh, I will too. We are collectively on a very. We're on a pro body hair uh, <laughs> deal here, and I'm talking like not me as a man. I'm talking like that is my preference in a woman is. Just FYI. Hell yeah. Body yeah. hair. You I get am, some body hair. Yeah. Everybody get some body hair. <laughs> <laughs> at least, <laughs> at very least, the pubic hair. Because after all, I, this is a sign of sexual maturity. I don't get it. No, I just I, don't I'm understand. I'm right there with you. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> oh, so ladies, I, I mean, you do you and do what's comfortable for you. Yeah. But man, if you like that, you don't let a man, don't let a man shear you it's also there for a reason you know it's there to protect you and all the things that could go wrong down there it's also it helps the sexual it helps the pleasure of the sexual act because there's less friction 
we should just start a sex positive podcast. We should. What are we doing here? We should. Here we are. Are we not that? <laughs> no, we are. <laughs> we talk about free love. I mean, enough. we're a cult podcast. Yeah, we talk about non-binary and homosexual. You know, we're, we're everybody. This is a sex positive podcast. Yeah. Anyhow, you got to have pubic hair. It's the '80s and the '90s. Oh yeah, everyone well, I, had that shit. We're gonna. I mean, yeah, they did. Definitely in the '80s. Um, I don't actually know, and I'm going to look at this. So this is why I sort of wanted to hold on this. Here we are. We're doing it, kind of. But uh, we will return to this topic because I would like to find out. By the time I was in college, you know, I'm like a decade ahead of you guys. Uh, that's right around the time when it started to disappear on women. It was about about then, the early 2000s, late 90s. Now, folks, reach out and tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, but I have not done any research on this. I'm a little, I'm pretty, fa- I'm a little bit fascinated, low, low key fascinated on this subject. So I'm going to see if I can find out when pubic hair vanished, mm. when I, it became a cultural thing to shave everything. I think that's interesting because I think I would agree with you because even when I think about like who I looked up to, like when I was like, yeah, you know, in the early 2000s, and they were very hairless. You know, everybody is like a naked mole rat. They have no hair on their bodies. They didn't even have eye- like eyebrows were plucked to death. Yeah, yeah, those tiny, tiny. All eyebrows. that. I, one thing that I always hated was that it was like women had to like for some reason shave their arms, like their forearms. That was yeah. a big well, thing. People still, I know people that actually do that. Oh, I know people who completely shave their entire existence, and it baffles me. You know, power to you, I guess. I yeah, I mean, it, here's the thing. Like, this is not a podcast where we're only for people who have pubic hair. But <laughs> so, we will accept so, you. If, yeah, you know, if you, no if you're what. doing this, be- it makes you feel sexy yeah. or you know comfortable or whatever. G- great, that's that's fine. But I I think that we are the underdogs here. In I mean, it's a freaking fetish, right? If you go on any any pornography, it's con- it's considered a fetish. Mm. to like the body in its natural state to, to to like pubic hair yeah right i yeah i mean that so we're the underdog here we're we're <laughs> the culture is shaved there's yeah. literally like it's a category right isn't like hairy yeah. a category <laughs> ridiculous it's i've weird. had ridiculous i've had people like full on just hitting on me nonstop, and then as soon as i just mention that i don't shave my armpits it's like oh, they're yeah. out they are yeah. gone faster than you I can. I don't understand if that. If anybody ever I don't get that asks as a you to off. shave, walk away from them. Yeah. Yeah. Find someone who appreciates you for the way you like to be. Yeah. Anyway, we'll get we'll get back. Yeah, we, we really so went on a things. whole There's tangent. There's so much more to we do did. here, but and we're not even we're not even done. There's so much more we could do on this subject. <laughs> we're, we're not, yeah. But we can't. We have to do the temple. <laughs> anyway. Okay. <clears throat> After allowing uh, the paper to dry overnight. <laughs> Yeah, what? Is that Wait, where what's we just... happening again? Okay, it was blood right. over the ovum. 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 Let's go back, yeah. Okay, so where were we? What was happening was, this is the initiation rite for the Temple of Psychic Youth. You're going to get this paper. You're stripping naked, which is cool. You're going to get this paper. You're going to put your deepest fantasy on the paper, mm. and you're going to put your, your spit and your blood and your ove on it. Cool. Oh, I thought the paper some... was made out of this somehow. I thought it's no, what you said. Olivia. Okay, I was nah, sitting here trying old. to figure yeah. that out, but that's tough. That's that's rough. T- I'm sure that's possible, but that sounds so. Very it's difficult. normal, fucking lined paper. Just regular paper. Okay. Yeah, it's easy stuff. <laughs> cool. Now you're going to attach your head hair and your pubic hair mm-hmm. to this paper, mm-hmm. and you're going to allow the paper to dry, which is good because you're going to stick it in the mail. <laughs> oh my. Okay. We're mailing it. <laughs> yes. Is this where the uh, mail thing comes mail. back in? Is it what? Is this where the the male oh, guy Kazaza? comes back in? He, we can see his inspiration here for sure. Okay. Anyway. So now you you mail this to your local temple. So again, there's different stations, right, in Australia and New Zealand and America, where they're going to keep it in a vault. This can be done anonymously, or you can go ahead and put your name on it, whatever you want to do. I would put my name on that paper. Be proud. Well, you're going to put a return address, right? Otherwise, you know... Yeah. You don't want you don't, you don't, that's you don't your pubic hair just wandering around the postal system forever. <laughs> Damn right, I'm putting <laughs> that return back address on it. Oh, God. My pubes are lost in the mail. After 23 <laughs> monthly submissions, along with a consent form, the initiate is considered a member. So you got to do this 23 times. I do it. Let's 23? go. 
essentially they're creating it's like this the vault itself i think is a, like a vessel of power and and it's a collective right of power to be participating in this what's the is number it, 23 though yeah that's what i kind of meant does that mean anything or is it just like oh, i'm sure it must but i don't know 23 hmm. cuz that just seems specific. like a random yeah <laughs> well it's one month short of 2 years yeah okay. like why there must be something to that. Well, I mean, I, I guess aren't our years not exactly right? So maybe 23 would better align with 24 moon, you know what but I mean? Why phase not it do, cycles. Do 24. Well, so I'm saying, Brie, that in 23 months, you might get through 24 moon ah, fi- cycles. Ah, 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 okay. I guess Possibly. I get what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. It's possible, right? Because the moon cycles are shorter than our our Julian calendar months. Yeah. Shit, they might have right. just picked a random number. We might be giving we them a lot of credit. Make these guys do this 23 <laughs> times. That seems like, How you know. How many should it be? Seems like an 13, not number. enough. 35, too many. 23, yeah, let's do that. Past 20, you know, it's commitment. <laughs> the temple separates itself from the earlier occultists it's been borrowing from by breaking with any system. There is no kind of ritual magic. Sorry, Crowley, there are no rules. This is, of course, a bit disingenuous. There are some rules. Mm-hmm. The initiation for a right, right, for example, like there are specific things you're supposed to do. And 23. And freedom from rules is its own kind of rule. But, you, you know, you get the general idea. Practitioners are meant to have incredible leeway in determining how they practice. The temple member must only believe in a functional system of magic and a modern pagan philosophy without recourse to mystification gods or demons, but recognizing the implicit powers of the human brain. This is what they call neuromancy. Kind of Satanism-esque. Yeah. Like magic. Well, with some magic, you have though. to believe in magic, but like don't believe in like all that other crazy shit is kind of like, well, at least Levian, I guess, is what I'm talking about. The absence of mystification gods and demons is essential to prevent the creation of a fixed system or goal. Mm -hmm. Mystification also risks the creation of false goals based on guesses about what lies beyond the veil. So you have to accept right away. We have no idea what they're saying lies beyond the veil, what the true nature of, you know, supernature is, of deity, of God, of the holy. We have no idea. So quit worshiping things because it's a guess. You're just guessing. These guesses form a kind of dogma, which is anathema to the temple. Faith is a corrupt state of mind, a relinquishing of responsibility to know your own mind and do as you will. This may sound uh, to some of our listeners a lot like mid-20th century existentialism. Hmm. Sartre, for example, said we cannot rely on any higher power to make our choices for us, since we can't be sure if such a power exists or what it wants if it does. And so we must choose for ourselves. The temple agrees with Sartre. Similarly, any results achieved through temple exercises should be analyzed in isolation rather than worked into some sort of paradigm. A great deal of energy is wasted on arguing over the validity of much that falls under the general heading of a cult, whether things are real or imagined. Much of the evidence to date is confusing, partial or fabricated to meet a given need. It is by far to accept occult experiences as they occur, to recognize and interpret them personally without trying to fit them into a predefined system. In the tradition of chaos magic, the act of making sigils is given precedence among all other occult acts. The initiation rite reveals the degree to which their sigils are less symbol-based than a lot of what Carol and Sherwin talk about, although the early chaos magicians left room for sigils that were as simple as writing on paper and bodily fluids. The sigil's job is to transcend the divide between conscious and subconscious thought, an accomplishment realized most easily through a blend of the states of orgasm and sleep. Transgasm. Huh. What? Transgasm? Transgasm. I'm sorry. (laughs) You want to blend? You want to be very tired and orgasming. Transgasm. All right. Yeah. The life goal of a temple member is to accomplish a state of capital zero, capital capital regret, zero regret, described as the magical state of inner balance and calm acceptance of the mortality of individuals and the use of zero regret to channel all future action. Mm -hmm. So repressions and fears are vented and expressed such that no time is wasted avoiding them or living in denial uh, in a kind of denial of death situation in which we fiddle to avoid the thought of our own mortality. We do what we want, when we want, 
because we truly want to do it. So we're all like Crowley or like Casanova wandering around doing as we will. Yeah. Love how you wow. throw in Casanova. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, t- I'm doing research on Casanova. It's, I guess, teaser oh, <laughs> for next that's year. Fun. Okay. Yeah. He was an occultist. Okay. Okay. So let's get to the third, th- chapter three, sound, in which we will not discuss body hair. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about occult sound and sampling. One of the more significant essays to come out of the temple, and one that interests me as a person who dabbles in sound-based occult practice, is Genesis Peorage's The Splinter Test, which can be found in their Psychic Bible. Peorage's ideas on sampling are not only fascinating from an occult standpoint, but also a musicological standpoint. Sampling goes back to musique concrète, created at the Studio d'Essai by Pierre Schaeffer, which drew on found sound, which is a term associated with John Cage, and a technique to manipulate audio tapes to create a sound that was not the direct product of musical instruments or human voices. So musique concrète is you know, finding ways of making sounds that doesn't involve anything that we would consider musical. We do Got that. Me? Yeah, we do that now, for sure. Back then it was cooler, though, because this is new. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, The Chamberlain was a device that connected a keyboard to a series of tapes, playing eight seconds of a tape when a key was struck. So you would hit the key and it would play eight seconds of the tape. You would have like, you know, 15 keys or whatever. I don't know how many, but each key would have its own eight seconds. So you could play the different eight seconds. You got it? Mm. In the 1960s, the Chamberlain gave way to the Mellotron. If anyone listens to uh, the Disgraceland podcast, he often opens with a Mellotron track. Fun fact. Cool. But you know, we're, not, we're not plugging that necessarily. <laughs> it's just that that happens. Uh, Kim, uh, clearly I must listen to it at least occasionally. <clears throat> so Chamberlain gave way to the Mellotron, uh, and then Kim, Kim Ryrie and Peter Vogel introduced the term sample to describe the work of their instrument, the Fairlight CMI, which was invented in 1979. With the Fairlight CMI, musicians could have real-time pitch control over sample audio, which then, so you got, you got me, you, you've got this machine that's got all these samples, and you can control the pitch of the sample live in front of an audience. Okay. Or I guess live as you're, you know, playing with a band. Mm-hmm. This drew the interest of Peter Gabriel, who used it in his third solo studio oh, album shit. to incorporate, you know that guy. My mom loves <laughs> Peter Gabriel. Peter yeah. Gabriel? Right? Yeah. Or no, He's no, good. Wait. wait. I mix him up with Peter Frampton. But oh, I think right. she also likes Peter Gabriel. But she loves Peter Frampton. Peter Frampton also did. Yeah, he, mm-hmm. did, he Peter Frampton also did some uh, oh. experimental sound stuff. Oh, girl loves him. But... She does. So Peter Gabriel used it in his third sto- solo studio album to incorporate sounds like breaking glass and bricks into his songs. A variety of 80s artists of varying degrees of indie and popness would go on to make use of these sampling techniques, including Kate Bush, Alan Parsons, Thomas Dolby, Blinded Me With Science, Todd Rundgren, Stevie Wonder, and Icehouse. Also other musicians who are, by degrees, less awesome and so need not be mentioned. Hmm. So if you're looking for an idea <laughs> of music I enjoy, Alan Parsons see is those good, guys. This is a good get. Yeah, Alan Parsons is awesome. Yeah, People are not listening. If you like Pink Floyd and are not listening to Alan Parsons, you're missing out. Pink Floyd kind of scares me, not going to lie. <laughs> a lot of people love Pink Floyd, though. Well, my, I, The Wall was a scary movie. That was the first time yeah. I was introduced to Pink Floyd. That's true. Mm, yeah. Also, Ice House, if you're not listening to Ice House, they're a bit deeper cut from the 80s. Is it like H-A-U-S? Or is it just ice? House? No, it's regular ice house. Damn. Like, yeah, yeah, like he would spell I it. I thought it was going to be something yeah. cool. Anyway. <laughs> Nothing. Uh, H-A- oh, there, Bauhaus is an 80s band as well. I think that's anyway. kind of what I was maybe thinking. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Peorage was among the first to make sampling a central part of his music and to theorize what sampling was all about. Sampling, Peorage said, uh, using found sound in the work of other artists could be an alchemical and magical process. A sample, no matter how brief, contains everything that the original creators and engineers put into it, and every context is touched or influenced by it. So if you take two seconds of a song, that contains everything about the creator and everything about the song. 
Getting a culty purge draws on contagion theory. If we shatter and scatter a hologram, we realize that in each fragment, no matter how small, large, or irregular, we will see the whole hologram. Any segment of a John Lennon song introduces the fullness of John Lennon-ness into any sigil, sound sigil. Mm, okay. You got that? Yeah. So all we are, that's it all you need. We're all, <laughs> you don't even need the whole thing. You got all your John Lennon-ness right in there. Saying, that's it. Makes my listening time shorter. Right? Splinters containing what he calls an infinite sequence of connections and progressions through time and space bypass the packages into which they were originally placed to form clusters with other splinters that together access a wealth of references in the listener's subconscious. We subconsciously perceive the fullness of the splinter's association when we hear the splinter, and the combination of splinters in a cluster creates a rich accessing of vast volumes of cultural experience. So we might not be able to say when we hear all that that comes from all we are saying is give peace a chance. But in our subconscious, we know. Bam, we're there. We're in the song. So we can do that with 100 songs in what, like a minute. And your subconscious is going, you know, into all these realms of the culture rapidly. The Sigil of Three Liquids. Hell yeah. Body hair. You get some body hair. (laughs) Working with splinters and samples can liberate us from the conscious control of popular culture. To understand this, we need to follow Peoridge's idea on the metaphysics of cultural expressions. When we express a thought, we create a little deity little god, which eventually takes on a life of its own, if others come to receive and believe in that thought. So Rob has an idea. He shares it with the alchemical actors. The alchemical actors are like, yeah, that's a cool idea. Then the alchemical actors put it out to the confessors and the audience listens, and they pick up the idea, and it becomes this entity of its own as more people accept it. Our brains become a neurovisual screen for these deities so that our ideas, our deities, may be reflections of previous deities, which begs the question, who made the original recording? In other words, once I put that idea out there, if somebody picks it up and repurposes it somewhere else, we may not know that it came from Rob originally. You know, by the time it's on podcast eight in 2050, where we don't even have podcasts anymore, we just, I don't know, have people shouting from their caves using podcasts. I have a dystopian future. <laughs> caves? I was going to say, we all have caves. I was like, wow. Yeah, we're all like living we're in living caves in... and we're shouting through palm leaves. That's how we're podcasting. So somebody shouting through their palm leaf, my original idea from way back when. We don't see that connection. So we don't know where the originals are. But Peorage is sort of asking us not to worry about it too much. The internet and cyberspace is working to become its own such god, which Peorage calls the psychosphere challenging us to seize the means of perception and remain the source. So not to just accept what the culture gives us, but to go ahead and cut it up and create our own products out of it. Mm -hmm. The internet gives us the opportunity to splice, to cut up, and to create using the creations of others. Unlike network television or studio movies that come in these nice, neat packages, the internet, as we all know, is rougher and more participatory. I mean, that's true of this podcast. Purage was writing this earlier than our, and we're by no means the roughest, by the way. Mm. <laughs> I mean, there's some craziness on YouTube, right? And all that. Yeah. And like the deeper YouTubes and all these different areas. Purage was writing this earlier than our recent decade, but these potentialities have only increased with the rise of YouTube and podcasts. Now I'm going to opine here a bit on my own. The danger for our psychic and intellectual freedom is the big producers moving in on these democratized technologies. Certainly, the alchemical actors and I can create a home for ourselves in the podcastosphere, but that home is threatened by big outlets like Wondery and NBC and NPR, who can shout louder than we can with all their funding to garner listeners. Their products, unlike ours, are slick and processed and more controlling of the listener's psyche. We can sometimes catch flack from listeners for incorporating personal opinions or threading the personalities of our actors through our discussions, but 
that's actually far more honest and real than all the clean, samey, this American lifestyle podcasts that tend to dominate our genre. End of rant. It's not really a rant. It's a very controlled rant. No, I get it. It makes complete sense. I feel like I'd rather listen to something where it's like people honestly just being how they are without having that sort of like corporate overlord mentality where they're just kind of being hovered over. Because if like you were like that, Rob, you just like hovered over us and controlled everything we did. I I would be fired. <laughs> Wouldn't be fun. It would be no. a weird be a weird little cult we would have yeah. here as opposed to a fun, liberating cult. Yeah. <laughs> where we talk about pubic hair freely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's that, it's the ability to improvise, right? Yeah. Which, you know, we we talk about a lot, devising and improvising. That's essential to speaking truth, to being honest, and not being controlled by these master narratives that predate us. But when we're listening to something like, I said This American Life, because in the podcast world, This American Life was sort of like, it was this NPR show, for our listeners who don't know, it's this NPR show that's, you know, decades long, I guess at this point, decades old. And a lot of the new early podcasts sought to be just like it. And I think that's still true to sort of mimic that style. But in mimicking that style, unlike us, where we could rant for five minutes on pubic hair, they're never going to do that. There's not this improvisation. There's nothing off the cuff. It's all very clean. And that for Peorage means that it's controlling your mind in ways that it shouldn't. The interruption is the opportunity for you to experience the freedom of others. And then you yourself should be able to take control of what we're doing here, our opinions and thoughts, and go use them on your own as you please. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So we don't necessarily oppose linear storytelling in our work um in fact it's kind of essential to getting our listeners to understand things but yeah. <laughs> they are a target for peorage linear arrangements are the product of societal control and go against the non-linear way our minds tend to function life is quite simply a stream of cut-ups on every level given the discovery of a means to describe and reveal reality we can also identify control Control denies intuition and instinct particularly, and dreams of all forms, randomness, thought. This reintegrates our personality according to the rhythms of time and the universe, not the arbitrarily developed rhythms of control. So if you, I mean, just thinking about the way your mind works, Peorage, we think about like, I don't know, Buddhism or, you know, these very meditative practices, they're trying to get our minds to, you know, be focused and attentive, in my opinion. Whereas Peorage is saying, the way our mind naturally works, where it sort of is moving between topics and, and this sort of thing is is good. It's the false narrative of, of cleanliness and, and linear storytelling that need to be corrected. Mm. Control needs time. Uh, like a junkie needs junk. Time appears linear. Cut-ups make time arbitrary, non-linear. They reveal, locate, and negate control. Control hides in social structures like politics, religion, education, mass media. Control exists like a virus for its own sake. Cut-ups loose in rational order, break preconceptions and expected response. They retrain our perception and acceptance of what we are told is the nature of reality. There it is. I realized I hadn't done it the whole time, and I really do. Yeah, and I, I did have a listener like write and say they missed the metal sound. Oh, well, it's a little problematic, but I understand. Yeah, the metal sound is controversial, but why is it uh, controversial? It's part of the fabric. This podcast is really. Oh, shut the hell up with that! <laughs> <laughs> they do it like every like once in a blue moon occasionally. I don't think you we can are sampling. Own it. Sound, but it's yes. just a guitar riff. <laughs> but now, literally, Peorage, we, we've just made the case, right? Peorage yeah. is saying <laughs> Brie has a right to sample as at will, to sample and repurpose. I'm allowed to do any guitar if I want. <laughs> That's just the easiest one to think of. 
Our sources today include Unholy Progeny, Psychic TV and Witch House at the Crossroads of Occultism in the Information Age by Daniel Seitman in the Journal of Musicological Research, also Andrew Wilson's article in Art Monthly, and Transgressive Represent- Representations, colon, Satanic Ritual Abuse in the Temple of Psychic Youth and First Transmission by Danielle Kirby in the Journal Literature and Aesthetics, also an introduction to the Temple of Psychic Youth at sacredtexts.com. Uh, and uh, you can certainly visit their website. Olivia, you've been on their website, yeah? Oh, my God. It's a shit show. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> it's not good. It's like some Sherry Shriner bullshit. Like, hmm. this isn't the if, 90s. Yeah, it was made. It feels like it was made in the late 90s and it hasn't been updated, which to me has a kind of charm. I, I have uh, nostalgia well. when I, I find my way into websites that have never been square specified, even though we have are square specified. We've but that's when before. we started. Yeah, we started in the era of Squarespace, so we couldn't create a website like that if we wanted to, and I don't think it would benefit us. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, you can look them up, and I think you'll get their website just by Googling them, right? Oh, yeah. That's all oh, I yeah. did. Okay, uh, that's it. Olivia, bring us on home. I hereby adjourn and declare close this meeting of the Secret Order of Alchemical Actors till such time as we get together and do it again. Uh, so we're going to be off um, of, I guess, timely episodes where you know we're really reacting in real time to our confessors for a little while because when we come back, we are going to be working with, uh, well, I'm going to be doing a, an alchemical anthropology episode with a couple of friends in Chaos Magic, friends of the podcast. Uh, that's going to be Luxus Strata and uh, Naya Ain, who's a longtime member of the Illuminates of Thanateros. Luxus Strata, of course, runs the Luxacult podcast. Yeah, we've talked about her quite a few times on the show lately. New friend of the show. Okay, so, <clears throat> uh, and a chaos magician. So, my name is Rob C. Thompson. I was joined today by Brie Literal and Olivia Literal, the Literal sisters. Goodbye. Bye. It's been real. The voice, our voice today of Genesis Peorge was provided by Jacob Wheatley. Thank you very much, Jacob. And uh, that's, that's all we have to say for this day. We will catch you next time for a little alchemical anthropology, and that's going to bring this, this discussion of chaos magic to a close, and uh, we'll start moving on to, uh, I guess, a little more Satanism, Satanic Ritual Abuse. Woo! Yeah. The effect of such conditioning is no less significant. Psychic... Psychic? What? Wait a second. It... <laughs> okay, I'm gonna do two takes. One with psychic and one with psychic. Because I don't know which one it is. <laughs> okay.